So I thought it would be nice to actually hear from um, someone that's actually been a part of NASA iTech from the beginning, but from an external perspective. He does not work for NASA. He doesn't work for the agency. And he's actually here. He's volunteered his time to be here, but he's He's a VC, and he's been in this in that space for a while. Um, Rich Godwin and I met on a on a panel on a stage. I was I was actually um, running a drug development company that could uh, reverse the effects of radiation on the body, the drug itself. And uh, Rich was working also in that space. We were talking about I think um, technologies. In, um, in space, and so we met then, we've been friends since then, but he's, um, he's an incredible person. He's, he really wants to kind of give you a perspective on what VCs look for, and maybe the less obvious things that are um, sometimes thought of in terms of what an investor might be wanting to see, and um, I thought it might be pretty, pretty neat to hear from his perspective. So if you guys could um, help me welcome Rich Godwin to come up and just speak. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks. Thanks, Kira. Um, I wanted to say thank you to Kira, Tom, Jen, Robin, and the rest of the team for um, uh, inviting me into the NASA iTech family. It's really been very um, fulfilling, very interesting. Um, I. I look at it as from the standpoint that I can relate and play, if you like, with some of the smartest people on the planet. Um, I, I would like to say from what Kira said this morning, she had a nine-year-old young lady <clears throat> who wanted to work for NASA. She definitely had me beat. I kind of wanted to work with NASA from about the age of 12. But uh, growing up in the UK, didn't really have much of a space program. We had very tall ladders. You know, you know, look over the houses, kind of thing. And uh, uh, but um, you know, when I first came to the states, my whole family has been in the RAF, all flyers, wing commanders, squadron leaders. So I was supposed to go into the RAF. Didn't want to go into the RAF. Who wants to fly Hawker Hunters? And you know, I wanted to fly Phantoms, stuff like that. So first time in New York, Times Square. I would go into the recruiting station there. Twenty years old. I want to join up the US Air Force and fly fast jets. Guy looks at me, you got a green card, son? I go, what's that? You go get one of those and then come back and see me. Well, it took me a little while, and I never actually got to, uh, to get into the, into the military. But one of the things that was interesting is that there are, there are a lot of people like me who are inspired by NASA and uh, by the space program who came to this country and ended up working in different areas. And I've employed thousands of people over here. And uh, that's been really fulfilling. But I don't think that gets put into the whole economy, the, the numbers of the economy of what NASA has done for the economy of the United States. So I think that that is something that we need to, to look at those numbers. So anyway, that being said, I've got to try and see if I can make sure this works right now. The big green arrow, right? So the NASA logo. Is it an agency logo? Is it a global brand? Or is it a cultural icon? The answer is yes, it is. It's all of these things. So NASA, a cultural icon. Here's some pictures of some iconic American culture. And these are not copyright protected, just so you know. <laughs> and that's, that's our husky ready for Halloween. That's lightning ready for Halloween. But these are the kind of things you think about when you think about American culture. But I think that these images is just a mu as much a part of American culture. And if you go to some of these world fairs and events around the world, the American stand will very often have a NASA stand because they're part of American culture. Now, I'm a Brit coming into America. Always wanted to be American since I was about seven. No other nation has or can currently take photographs like these. People talk to me about the failure rate of going to Mars. 
take out all the other guys and put in the failure rate of NASA, and it's a lot less failure rate. And I'm quite proud of that. But what I'm saying here is not, it's not jingoism or nationalism. This is what I consider to be American culture. So why am I talking about culture? What does that have to do with innovation and the financing of new technologies? And the answer is everything. And this is something I found a short while ago that it's not just having a technology that matters, but it's capacity to fit in with the culture of the day. So you're going from an invention to an innovation. And that's a very big, different thing. That's like when Einstein said, you know, 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. It's the same thing when you take an invention and you try and turn it into an innovation that is accepted by the public or a global marketplace. So it, it, very different uh, skill sets and very different um, uh, uh, skills that you need to get to the point of being an innovation. So people say, you know, don't just VCs just want to know about these. And I, I should tell you that Starbridge, I'm a venture partner in Starbridge, and we're a new VC, com uh, VC entity. We started last year. Uh, we're investing in space technologies or dual-use space technologies, things that can be used in space or things from space that can be used on, in global marketplaces. And we're just getting going. Um, we're uh, trying to close our first round. It's not easy to close a, uh, a round in a space-based venture fund. You know, so it's a, it's a hard sell right now because people say, we have no way of doing the due diligence. We have no way of checking whether you're right or not. And that's why we have a team that not only understands the financial aspects of VCing, where, where money goes and how it works, but we also have the skill set in terms of the technical, where we can look at a seed investment and say, yeah, that's right, or nah, go back and think that again because the physics don't match up. And I'm very pleased and proud to say that people like Harry uh, are, are on our team. And I can call Harry up and say, is this real? And Harry will go, yeah, maybe, maybe not. So I'll get back to these, these little um, snippets in a, in a minute. I want to tell you a little story. You, some of you may have known of Heron of Alexandria. He basically invented the first steam engine, the Eoli pile. And it was about Heron, who lived in Alexandria around about 30 AD. He was an inventor. And he invented things like the first vending machine. Coin put in the top. Out came a little measured quantity of um, holy water in the temple. And that was pretty impressive and clever. But he also created the world's first steam engine. Heat, the water's in that kind of big basin. It goes up the pipes, and he had two nozzles that were compressed. And as the steam heated up, the steam turned this thing at a rate of knots. It was a steam engine. And when he first showed it to the Greek king, the Greek king was very amused. So this is great. This is fabulous. Hiram made the mistake of being taken in by the king's uh, uh, acceptance of this apparent toy. And when he told the king what this could do in terms of work, the king kind of took him to one side and went, no, 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 no. If you did that, what would we do with all the slaves? Right? And so, boom, end of the steam engine for 1,700 years. Didn't happen. Politically, culturally, socially, it was not acceptable when you had cheap slave labor to do all the things that this machine could do for you. The second one, and I take this one, there's a book that many of you, I, I've, I was recommended to read it by um, a very good friend of mine at Johnson Space Flight Center, Dennis, uh, Dennis Stone, who some of you probably know. He was involved in the COTS program. And Dennis said, there's a book out there called Diffusion of Innovations. You need to read it. And I did, and it was, it was a hard read, but it was a fascinating read. What I mean by this story, this happened in the last century, the Egyptian government, they had a lot of villages that were away from the Nile, and so these people didn't have water. So they decided to build canals off the Nile out to these little villages in the desert. 
Um, and it was great because you could take little boats along. And now the denizens of those little villages had water. Well, after a few decades, they went back to see how this was working out. And they found that these canals in the village, they were fetid. They were full of dead animals, human waste. Uh, they were really disgusting. And the women would be down there washing the clothes in this stuff. And it was like, well, we've got to fix this. So they put water pumps, hand water pumps, in the middle of the villages. And they thought, problem solved. Fresh water, get down to the water pump, get your water, no problem. They went back a few years again. The water pump is just dripping away. And the women are back at the fetid canal, all washing the clothes, taking the water and boiling it to make, to make their, their food or, or drinks. I'm like, what gives? You have a water pump here in the village that will give you fresh water, but you go back to the canal and you're using stinky water. What's the problem? And the women told them, they said, well, sometimes the water pump doesn't work. And so people are fighting over the water. We don't want to fight. And, you know, we actually all like to go down by the canal and all chat to each other while we're doing the laundry. Culture. They didn't get it. They thought a technological device would just be accepted because it was better in their minds, but they didn't take into account the cultural difference, in particular of the women, because I will point out that women make most of the decisions in terms of who buys what in the, on this planet um, and, and how they consume, how they consume, right? So. I was thinking, so here's a new technology. This is just an idea. What if someone created a new robot that can effectively and safely pilot commercial airliners replacing humans? Oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong robot. OK. Just be careful. This, just so you know, that is his, his public photograph as the governator. So it's not copyrighted. So. Would I get on a plane? I know that planes basically fly themselves today. But would I get on a plane that was being flown by a robot? I'm thinking, ah, I like to have somebody up there who really has skin in the game in terms of flying this airplane. You know? The robot, ah, oh, sorry, I screwed up. Boom, you know? Pilot's going to do everything he can because his skin is on the line as well. So I think this is like a cultural issue here that. Yes, is it possible? Yeah, and the government would probably be a very eager client, right? And government can be a good client as long as they're not your only client because there are the whims of Congress and then there are winds of finance or, or commerce and they're two very different things. So great to have government as a, as a client but not your only client. You also need that pathway to the second client, the third client, the 5,000th client. You have to be constantly building a business model if you want to be a sustainable business. You cannot just think about that first client. You have to think about all those other clients and how you're going to acquire them. So let's see if we've got that. Let's go back to this. So you always, like I said, you need to be building a business model. We all know about things like burn rate. Are you going to run out of cash? You've got to be really careful about that. You can't afford to run out of cash because then you're flapping around. And people know that. They smell the blood. And they'll get a better deal out of you want their money. You've got to look at the total available market. What is that total available market? Where really is it? And I, and I know some of the people here today have said, uh, you know, if we could get 5% of the market or 2% of the market. And I always go, what if you only get 0.001% of the market? Does your business model still work? Because 2% sounds, oh, it's tiny. No, it isn't. Not in a big global market. 2% is huge. So you have to think about in terms of that, oh, if we only we could get 2%, you might not get 2%. Timing to market is one of the most critical things in any startup and company. Timing has been found to be the thing that can kill you the most often getting you through getting through to that valley of death point so timing is is a is a huge barrier that you have to be constantly aware of intellectual property rights that's a business model are you building a moat 
Are you building a moat to protect your assets and your intellectual property? And that is a business model. It could be your only business model. It doesn't have to be. You can have that as, I mean, um, one of my partners is here in the audience and we have a new uh, energy company and we are, we've definitely built the moat around our patent filings, but we're also looking at other aspects of different business models that will bring us to revenue early if we can get to that low hanging fruit. But building the moat is really important. Your team, we all know that. I, I think we all know that. And that's one of the reasons I asked uh, some of the guys here this morning, you know, who's your team? Because you have to have that diversity of skill sets. You know, when, you, when one of the biggest axioms of venture capital is a B product with an A team will always beat an A product with a B team. It's axiomatic. It's the team that people look at. Can these people deliver on what they say they're going to do? And then finally, who's the client? Who's the client? Who's the client? It's really important to be always, you know, be able to say to me as a potential investor, well, who are you going to sell this to? Who, who are you selling this to? Who's paying you? Who's paying the bills? So you don't have to keep coming for equity, which is expensive. You've got revenue. So how do you lose control of your company? That's a very interesting question. And it comes down to these. Timing and valuation are all important in how you raise funds for your company. And they all revolve around the benchmarks that you produce. So you have to look very careful at what your benchmarks are. And what I mean by benchmarks, what are those critical points in the, in the life of your company when, hey, if I do this, I know that my valuation is going to change immediately that I've done this. Like you get issued a patent, patent issues. Or you get a big investment from a strategic investor. Or you sell your first product. Benchmarks, benchmarks. Your first prototype, your first production prototype. If you, once you get to those, those benchmarks, once you've identified them, they change the valuation of your company. And so the timing of your fundraising should be built around those benchmarks because you don't want to be, A, you don't want to be raising too much money at the start because you're going to be giving away your company. You're going to be selling your company cheap. You want to take in just as much as you need to get to that next benchmark. That's the most important thing to do. And so when you get to that next benchmark, then you go into your next fundraising round. It doesn't have to be a seed a series A or a series B. It's just the next point where you say, I've proven this. Now I want to raise some more money at a different valuation because this proof values my company differently. So those are the three things that are most important to how you make sure you don't lose control of your company. Finally, I'm getting back to that culture thing. Um, this is from a, a young lady, uh, a scientist in, in uh, England, who I just came across some of this writing of hers and, and uh, I thought, this is really quite inspired. She, uh, and she wrote these things. It's half of what you do, you've got the technical side, the rational side of your company and your invention. And we kind of quantify a lot of the times in the past we've had the uh, IQ test. The IQ test is like, how clever are you? How, how fast can you assimilate information? And I saw a great episode of young Sheldon the other day where they were, they were taking him and his twin sister for testing. And Sheldon was brilliant at identifying rational things, but totally inept on the emotional IQ side, whereas his sister was exactly the opposite. And she was completely on, she had an emotional IQ that was way ahead of Sheldon but it was completely pertinent to the system and the test that they were in. And I, it was really funny, but I thought, you know, one's not more smarter than the other. It's, it's a way that you interact with your world. And so the other half is like she's, this Angeliki said, it's half organizational design and half therapy. And like the rational part of the system, your goals, strategies, processes, and metrics, now, these are things that you can write down on paper, right? I'm sorry, I don't want to mean to be reading this, but I had to put this up here so you, you could see this. 
the rituals involved in your process of going from invention to innovation are hidden. You can't codify them or reference them. They are hidden there, but they are there. And when you're talking to an investor, the slightest little thing can kind of turn them off, which you have no idea what it was. And it's nothing to do with your figures or your technology. It's like something just didn't sound right. And it's like, no, nah, not doing that. And it, it's just like that. And that can change whether you can raise money or not. Uh, and so it's very, I, I think it's very important to be aware of the, the not the emotional, it's the emo, it is the emotional IQ side of it, and it's the culture culture side of a, a company and how it will interact with uh, the population at large. So the last word from me is diversity. And I think it's, it's reprehensible that in Silicon Valley, you know, they say 2% of startups are financed are female-led companies. And it's like, why? And they'll say, oh, we don't have female-led companies. And Jen will say to you, that's a load of, I won't say the word, you know, it's just not right. And I think from the standpoint of engineers and people who are trying to put companies together, you need to get diversity to come in and look at your technology because it's not looking at the nuts and bolts. It's looking at how are people going to interact with this product in general life? And you guys are smoking. What are you guys smoking kind of thing? Then people are not going to do that, you know, and here's why. And the engineers sometimes will go, well, I never even thought about that. Hello? Yeah. You know, so I think diversity is, is really, you know, and I'm not just talking about women here. I'm talking about all sorts of diversity of people looking at these things from a different uh, aspect. And, and I think that's incredibly important if you want to have a successful company. So these are um, the two uh, um, operations that I'm part of. Uh, Space Technology Holdings is my company based down in... Uh, San Diego, and we are building companies from new technologies. And then, as I said, Starbridge Venture Capital, we've just kind of started up. Uh, we're raising funding for uh, space-based, dual-purpose um, technologies. So with that, um, open up to questions. There's my. Yeah, um, yeah. There's there's a couple that come to mind, and, and one of them is is um, some people who were here at, um, in in New York, and I, I refer to an incredible technology with Atomos, and I looked at that company. And I thought, holy moly, you know, NASA absolutely needs that technology, but is that something that can translate into a marketplace? It's like, phew, that's a hard sell. Um, that, that was um, that propulsion, nuclear propulsion and nuclear tugs in space, which are you know, absolutely axiomatic that we need those. If we want to settle the solar system, we need that technology. So I looked at that and I thought, that's a no-brainer. That's a no-brainer. But from a, uh, an investment standpoint and a commercial side, I looked at it and I went, I don't see a pathway for me yet. Now, Jeff Bezos might. Jeff Bezos might look at that and go, that is really interesting and I want to get into that. Even Elon or Gwyn, probably more Gwyn more than uh, than Elon, could look at that and say, "Yes, we, we need to start working on that." So, but um, another one was uh, reaction engines in the UK. Uh, Alan Bond, and um, he was working at British Aerospace, and he designed the Hotol single stage to orbit vehicle, and he filed a patent, 
and as, in the UK. And as soon as he filed the patent, the Ministry of Defense went top secret, put it in a box, and it never saw the light of day. And yeah, and so uh, Alan was, you know, he was devastated by this because it, should, it could work. Uh, but I don't know what it is about the British mentality, but you know, it's slumped like, you know, an, an atomic bomb? No, don't be ridiculous, you know? And whereas Americans go, what? Let's try that, you know? And um, I think that, that, that's, you know, <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, and so what happened with Alan is that that got stuck in a highly classified box. Nobody could look at it. Nobody did anything with it, not even the Ministry of Defense. They just stuck it in a box. And um, so when he invented the Sabre engine, which is now being financed, financed up the yin yang, he made very careful, very sure that he didn't step over that boundary of national security and, and top secret. And I met him a few years ago at a very nice party in London. And I said, okay, so you've got this new engine and uh, it's a single stage to orbit engine. It's a dual use hydrogen. Uh, it can use atmospheric oxygen and then it turns over to in internal oxygen all the way to orbit. They were gonna put it on the Skylon, single stage to orbit uh, spacecraft. And I said, okay, so the engine now, you've got the cooling system, which was the biggest thing. They got the cooling system work working. And I said, how much is it gonna cost to get to a production model? And they said, eh, about 160 million pounds. And I went, that's not too bad, you know, that's pretty good. The government will probably bankroll you. And they did, the government bankrolled them. And now Boeing is coming in and Rolls-Royce is coming in and everybody's bankrupting, uh, bankrolling them. But then I said, what about Skylon, the actual platform that it was gonna go on? And he said, eh, we've kind of separated that out now into a separate company. I said, well, how much? 12 billion pounds. I'm like, oh, you're not gonna get that from the British government. I said, so I have some friends in America who'd be quite interested in your engine to put it on a different platform. And he said, yeah, we're not talking to them. And I'm not taking their calls. Because he knew immediately that if he did that, ITAR would just go boom, and he'd be in a black box again. So the, these are, those are kind of national security issues, but it's the same, you know, where you can look at something and go, that's not quite ready. Like autonomous vehicles? Uh, I, think I think that'll happen. Yeah, I've done that. that. Probably about five years ago mm -hmm. that, that I was I was in one of their models or one of their vehicles, um, you know, driving, and I, I thought, oh my gosh, every vehicle I have has to have this. But I think there might be some people that weren't as ready for it five years ago. But I think as that's being introduced yeah. incrementally, I think, and and you have pieces of it, maybe there might be someday we might actually have that. Right. And I think one of the other things that, that brings on the point of um, startups are always claiming, I have a disruptive technology. And that, that word, once it gets out there to the status quo, is very disruptive. And they kind of look at it and go, I don't want to be disrupted. And so if you start saying that your technology is disruptive to all these different places, that you're going to start making a lot of enemies. And so you have to be really careful, you know, and that's what we're doing with our battery companies, we're keeping right under the radar and not telling anything about what we can do until we're ready. You know, so that, that's, that's really important. You say to somebody, you're a disruptive technology. And when we met with Horizon X, I asked them, I said, uh, so you've been told to go out and find these technologies. I said, disruptive technologies? And they said, yes, absolutely. Even if it disrupts your own business model at Boeing, and they went, yes, and I kind of went, hmm, okay. I believe that when I see it, but you know, it, it is it is a dangerous word to use if you don't use it carefully. So uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, I've heard 
uh, space technology investors make a joke. Uh, you know, the best way to become a millionaire in space tech, right, is to start with a billion dollars. Yep. Um, so my question is, you know, what is the, the patience and time horizon for venture capitalists in space technology um, when you start looking at things like deep space industries that are looking at not getting an ROI possibly for decades out? Yeah, um, it, it is a really good question. And most VCs are looking for ex exits. So, I mean, an exit doesn't have to necessarily mean scaling the company to massive revenue. It could be the next round, you just exit at the next round uh, if that's available. Um, but most VCs are looking at mm, five years tops, uh, depending on the VC company. And like you said, with space, it tends to have a much longer horizon. And so you tend to look for people who have more of an impact. They want to have an impact in the way they invest. They want to diversify. One of the things we're trying to do at Starbridge is saying, yeah, you want to invest in space, but instead of investing just in this one company, why don't you invest in us and we'll, we'll spread your risk load uh, because we're very careful about what we invest in and who we invest in. And uh, we are looking for the lower hanging fruit at the moment, but we are also looking at, you know, uh, companies, Axiom, uh, that are w quite a bit further out there. But you look at the team and you go, you know, the these people are going to do this. They're, this is going to happen. And it's not just going to be down to NASA. This is going to be a real business. And is that something we want to get involved in? And OK, if it takes a little bit of time, it takes longer. But this is a big upside. So you know, you're kind of you're doing roundabouts and swings in terms of the potential upside and the downside of whether or not the team you think can deliver. You know, but yeah, usually five, seven years tops, whereas some of these, some of these things are 15 years out. But that's why I always say to people, hey, if you can do that, if you can do that on Mars, what about back here on Earth? What could you do back here with that technology? Yes, that's great to go to, to Mars and, and develop, but back here on Earth, how could we utilize that, that dual use purpose? And that's, that's what I look for a lot of times to see how that can work. Because then you've got a global market, you've got sustainability at that point. I think, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. I think I'm done. Thank you, Dave.